Saudi Arabia, the heart of the Middle East. Saudi has an incredible history, an immersive culture, and Saudi hospitality is legendary. Today, Saudi is also known as the world's largest oil exporter, and it's also home to the world's largest green hydrogen project. And now, home to the world's first cognitive city. Saudi Arabia is headed towards a new direction, a new tomorrow, a new future that's powered by technology. In the Digital Kingdom, I will tell the story of Saudi Arabia's vision of entering a new age, the age of a technology-driven future. From the world's largest smart city developments to changing the focus of government to utilize data to drive the economy, the Saudi economic landscape is rapidly shifting towards technology and innovation. And what is apparent is with its incredible talent pool, future opportunities and focus on technology are together going to create a new... Join me, Ian Khan, in my journey of finding out what the future holds for Saudi Arabia as I speak with leading experts in government, the private sector, global technology companies and others to learn about the evolution of the digital kingdom. Saudi has a strategy to make the kingdom the hub for AI development and AI in general by the year 2030. Some of the organizations that are responsible for making this happen are Sadaya, the Saudi Data and Artificial Intelligence Agency that was formed just a few years ago, but over the last couple of years, it has made incredible progress by launching different apps, especially through the pandemic. There's a focus uh, to use technologies such as artificial intelligence and of course cloud technologies and others to make sure this data is utilized to the best extent to help everyday common people uh, to utilize technology and to benefit. So there is an ecosystem, it's, just, it's not just one single entity. So we do have the NDMO, the National Data Management Office, which is the entity that is responsible of setting the policies, drafting the laws, that are related to data and AI to make sure that we are, from the legislative perspective, we are mature enough for the economy to be developed. Also, there is the National Center of Artificial Intelligence, which is the entity that is responsible of doing the R&D in data and AI and developing innovative solutions to contribute to the economy and take it to the next level. And we have NIC, the National Information Center, which is the entity that is responsible of developing and operating mega data and AI initiatives that would enable the sector. And Sadaya is the entity that is orchestrating all of the efforts in a way that we make sure that we are advancing properly towards our national ambitions in data and AI. Data actually is the new oil. Countries now are recognizing the impact of data and it becomes actually as a national asset for them. Uh, through maximizing uh, the data collection and processing and also generating uh, valuable solutions uh, from the data. That data, massive data, it allowed us to see uh, things from not just 10,000 feet but from 100,000 feet. We can do all the data fusion that is possible to be done. You have the education data, you have labor market data, you have commercial registration data, so then you can do all the data fusion, help decision makers to get from basic aggregations all the way to um, building machine learning models that can answer sophisticated questions, all the way to building simulations to simulate certain policies, the investments that the kingdom has put in place when it comes to the digitization of the kingdom in the past 10, 15 years is paying off now. A lot of people were questioning whether those investments back then were the right investment. And the kingdom even doubled down on those investments five, six years ago when Vision 2030 was established. We were going even bigger. In today's fast-changing world, the demands for data governance, data management, and information management in general are some of the biggest challenges for both the private as well as the public sector. For governments especially, the ability to efficiently manage citizen data and citizen information is of the highest importance 
And to achieve this, technology provides a number of avenues. We see use cases from many different countries across the world where huge progress has been made by using cutting-edge technologies to manage user data. In fact, a number of governments across the world have started using decentralized databases such as blockchain to manage citizen data. Saudi Arabia is leading its efforts to ensure citizen data is safe and more than anything else that the highest level of privacy and data protection are enabled for any information that is gathered from citizens. This is the core of the Saudi Digital Identity Program, NAFAT. One uh, domain that we are extremely proud to be working at is the digital identity. We have developed uh, NAFAT. It's a single sign-on solution. So for an individual user, a digital user, he has one credential that he could use to access multiple applications. What do you gain by doing that? First, you make the journey extremely pleasant. And then for the applications, they don't really have to incur additional costs because they really don't have to keep and maintain identity access management solutions. Now we have more than 17 million users subscribing to our service. And we have about more than 300 entities all subscribing to our service. So for those 17 million users, they can access about more than 300 applications using the same credentials. All government entities plus the private sector are deeply committed to create the digitization journey, build the infrastructure. There are multiple layers in this. So NIC, Sadaya is actually touching across all these layers, starting from the digital infrastructure that enables innovators by which we can monetize this data, benefit out of this data, create all these kind of innovative experiences. This means we need to focus on data quality. If this data is not a good quality, we will not achieve the goal at the end. In addition to that, SMEs and entrepreneurs are not only looking for open data, but we should focus on other mechanisms that help support them to get high quality data and utilize this data to come up with some products or services that help support society as a whole. Data undoubtedly plays a critical role in everything that happens in our world today. Even traffic lights and roads generate data. And the progress that Saudi Arabia has made and continues to make in this domain is extremely impressive. Saudi also handles a very critical part of a massive amount of data management in a short duration of time in the year. And that is during the journey of Hajj, the Islamic pilgrimage that takes place every year in Saudi Arabia. Over 20 million Muslims from across the world come to Mecca and managing data and information and that volume and veracity is a task in its own. This is just one example of how seriously Saudi Arabia is taking information and data management and the whole idea of digital identity very seriously. Between 2019 and 2021, the COVID-19 pandemic struck the whole world. It crippled entire countries. Every industry across the world was shocked by the disruption in business and billions of dollars across the world were incurred in losses. Nations did what they could to contain the breakout and keep their citizens safe. One key challenge in this time was the delivery of new government services. And for that, it was necessary to lay down the foundations for new processes and systems. This is where Saudi Arabia excelled by developing a new solution, Tawakalna. Literally translating to trust, the release of Tawakalna was one of the fastest deployments of a technology-based solution for a country of almost 35 million people. When Tawakalna started, it was actually initially just for permission. So people uh, used to apply to ask for permits for them to move from one place to another. But then over time, as the pandemic gets deeper and deeper, there was a need to create a system that allows everyone in the country to check the immunity and the, stat the health status of people. And we started building, the team started building uh, all these services to enable all the law enforcement, all the uh, facility owners, shop owners to check whether this person uh, got, got corona or not. This was the first service 
that suddenly became required. Sadaya was able to pull all resources around with National Information Center, building all the infrastructure, building all the development team, creating all the journeys. The team were literally in sleepless weeks, <laughs> not nights, for almost two months or so. They need to create these uh, services in very short period of time and without jeopardizing security, without jeopardizing privacy, without jeopardizing performance. And the amount of support we got from, from the top leadership of the country was tremendous. Saudi is not new to collaboration. In fact, it was the vision of modern Saudi Arabia's founder, King Abdul Aziz Al Saud, who laid the foundation of Saudi Arabia's economy through collaboration. The partnership with foreign oil companies led to not only the development of the oil industry, but also to its skyrocketing growth to the extent that Saudi Arabia has become one of the world's largest exporters of oil in the last eight decades. The kingdom continues the tradition of collaboration and leading many new initiatives. This includes laying down the foundations of initiatives such as the Digital Cooperation Organization, a think tank dedicated to helping countries across the world take a step into digital transformation, or the establishment of the Future Investment Institute, a think tank that was founded in Saudi and now is a global organization for investing into the future. Saudi is now home to new initiatives in the areas of carbon exchange, manufacturing, agri-tech, technology, climate change, and more. Much of this is attributed to the initiative known as Vision 2030. When I visit countries that have great ambition, I often ask them, are you positioning yourself not to be good at what you're doing, which you can be, but to lead others, to create models for other communities and other countries. This nation has decided that they want to be innovation leaders, that they want to be able to create new ideas and new solutions that solve problems in the United States or around this region or into Africa. And it's clear to me, looking around, that if the existing trajectory continues, this will be a formidable force globally in just a few years. If you read the Vision 2030, you will find a lot of things to, to be achieved on the logistics side, on the tourism side, healthcare, education, and you name it. In order for the government to be able to achieve them, you have to have a digital, a strong, robust digital foundation behind it. Listen, we cannot build enough data centers quick enough, okay? The, the, the transformation is massive. The farm we built here is in, in partnership with a company called Nadek, a national agriculture development company. A traditional dairy and juices and other company that is really trying to innovate and, and, and tech up, if you will, and join the new economy, right? What's great is we saw Nadek investing in a 30 megawatt solar power farm. Well, what we did is partnered on their land. We're building inside of what used to be alfalfa crop pivots, wasting a lot of water, but they have the water infrastructure. And now we have a, a huge scale farm that will be producing 140 tons a week of premium tomatoes starting in March. 140 tons a week, significant capacity of 16 varieties of tomatoes, half of which have never been tried in the region. They're novel products. We're, we're changing the human experience in the, in the platter, but also at a much lower cost than imports, very little water consumption, right? And it's all made possible by two partners coming together, a traditional company with infrastructure and us partnering with that infrastructure with our, our capabilities. When it comes to collaborators, definitely we get to collaborate with the leading companies in data, artificial intelligence. But yes, I think you need to be extremely selective in what could offer you a better solution. This is very important. And when it comes to benchmarking, usually when we get to develop our strategies, whether the business strategy or the technical strategy or the cybersecurity strategy, we really work with the best leading consulting firms to make sure that we get to benchmark ourselves and to properly set our ambitions and our goals. And to, do, to start from where others ended, not from where others started. And our vision is uh, to establish the kingdom as a global leader in the elite lead of the data and AI driven economy. So here in Riyadh digital city, we have all the government entities, uh, all the offices. And what you see here 
is a different kind of energy when it comes to collaboration, when it comes to uh, meeting people, everything is around here. So it's been incredible meeting different people from different government entities uh, and talking to them about the actual change uh, that is happening here in Saudi Arabia. I'm here at the region's largest technology conference, something that hasn't happened in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for many years. In fact, this conference called LEAP is the first of many of these initiatives that are going to take place. At this conference, we're hearing about trillions of dollars of investment money into different initiatives. For example, technology spend on artificial intelligence, blockchain, connected cars, infrastructure development, and many other things. Saudi Arabia is at a critical point right now because it's focusing more on the data economy rather than what it's been doing for the past eight, 10 decades is focused on oil. The future of the Saudi market is more about leveraging technology to change everything, to change the economy, to change jobs, to empower youth and communities, to build a new kingdom that powers not just itself, but the entire Middle East. Right from the beginning of the different industrial revolutions, automation has been a key factor for progress. Today, automation acts as an accelerator for most industries operating in any country. Industrial automation is highly used in Saudi Arabia due to its focus on industries such as the energy industry and its various aspects such as upstream and downstream oil, refining, petrochemicals, electricity generation, and manufacturing industries. What is the future of automation in Saudi's fast developing economy? This also opens up the discussion for a thriving cybersecurity industry in Saudi Arabia. The first step we do in digitalization is where we move into, we can automate and connect something. It's cheap, we automate everything which is non-core, everything which is core, that means you differentiate on, we don't touch. You can come closer to your clients, you can have a more um, view from your end-to-end -end supply chain management information, right? You can have a direct view on where the product is on your warehouse. You can manage and control far better. These are important tools for oil and gas. These are important tools for government sectors to provide better services and all of this. The next step we move into is that you are the owner of that information. Think about in two, three years, I think in Saudi, you will hold your own healthcare record. You will have your information on your taxes, on your services, on your cars, everything in one that is totally locked and cyber secure thing that we need to really work at is the end user awareness. Because regardless how much investments you have done in protecting the infrastructure and the digital assets, if you have a user with not much awareness, he could be the loophole. And many attacks come through the end users, not through the infrastructure and the protected infrastructure. In today's fast-growing Saudi economy, there are multiple hundreds of billions of dollars of investment being put into infrastructure, upskilling talent, digitalization, and other critical aspects of making Saudi a global economic leader. Today, the kingdom has multiple venture funds that are creating hundreds of startups and solving some of the biggest problems in the world. The Saudis are putting their money where their mouth is. You've got billions of dollars of investment fund going into entrepreneurship, accelerators and incubators. You've got giga projects happening. We're talking about NEOM, which has to be one of the biggest projects or construction projects in the world, in the history of the world. $500 billion financed city and area of the future. So clearly the time is right to bring the world's most emerging technologies, futurists, impactful people working in tech, to Saudi Arabia so that they can be part of this journey and feed into it. One element we see here, they embrace digitalization like this is a normal part of their gene, right? It just turns on something for them. They're even excited about it. 
So everything is connected, everything is somehow sensed. The early evolution of smart cities is now turning on the development of cognitive cities. Urban development is fast changing the way we live, study, work and travel. Saudi today has embarked on multiple mega infrastructure projects such as NEOM, The Line, Red Sea Development and others. We are a planet now that where over half of humanity lives in cities and that's just going to grow over the next few years. This is going to be the century of cities and all the big issues, whether it's transportation or energy or the climate emergency, we've got to solve these within cities because this is not just a topic about our urban centers. This is a topic about the future of the planet. So faced with some great challenges and all the promise that cities bring, we've got to bring new innovation, new ideas, new technologies to apply against these big problems. And you know, while we can do the right thing, we ought to do good, we can also do well. We can build businesses, we can build new innovation that creates new solutions for communities all over the world. Look, at the end of the day, smart cities is about quality of life. It's about a better human experience for everybody. The huge majority of Saudis are youth, with approximately 37% under the age of 14. 51% of the kingdom's population is under the age of 25. With such an incredible talent pool of future generation economic contributors, Saudi is sitting on a resource that many nations are currently struggling with. The kingdom is home to institutes such as the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology and King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, to name a few. Some of the world's top talent is now teaching faculty at these institutions and the quality of learning and gaining skills to build a better tomorrow are second to none. Saudi is truly undergoing a new technology and education revolution. It's a very interesting time in Saudi Arabia with Vision 2030 and all of the digital initiatives that's happening. There is a lot of investment in terms of talent and job creation for the skills of the future. MCIT, the Ministry of Information and Telecommunication, is investing a lot in, uh, in a huge initiative that targets the skills of the future for Saudi uh, locals and for the citizens. What we are doing uh, at Microsoft as well, part of that direction, is we have managed to train more than 100,000 students in IoT, AI, cloud computing, and others. We're also working very closely uh, with the governments and organizations to uh, also train and simulate the work of technical uh, people. So definitely data and AI open many opportunities. And by the way, the opportunities are not only technical. There is also the opportunities related to governance and policies. By enhancing the maturity or the legislative maturity in data and artificial intelligence, you will open more opportunities for people to work in this field, like having lawyers in data and artificial intelligence, having legal experts in data and artificial intelligence, policy experts. Are we doing really a, a good job when it comes to building those universities, choosing the disciplines that your, those universities should focus on? How can we make sure that those universities, the output of those universities, is very much aligned with what the labor market needs? And so the idea is that we work with the Ministry of Education, we work with the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Services to do such evaluation. And the results were, you know, very surprising to many. We enable those universities to, to um, use such insights to help them make uh, better uh, decisions when it comes to the investments that they will make. One of the characteristics of this great nation of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia right now is that it has a very large and growing young population. And they have a chance to create a new future, to bring new ideas to the table. They need to create and be engaged in the type of future that they want. So that means expanding education to include things like software development, 
programming like we're seeing all over the world. This is already happening, of course. Giving as many children as possible access to the different tools that can enable them to be inspired, to understand things like science, technology, engineering, mathematics applied uh, to solve the great problems of a great nation. Countries want to create environments where the young population and the new working population don't feel like they have to look elsewhere for the great opportunities, that they are here at home. And that means investing in our kids, investing in their education, inspiring them and really believing what they can do to create a, uh, a, a prosperous future for this land. I'm quite used to going to tech events in different countries. And one of the most arresting things about Saudi is the fact that you have such a large proportion of female visitors to this event. And the tech industry in Saudi Arabia has 28% female participation at this moment in time. And that is an upwards trend and it's growing. That is leading, world leading in terms of other countries. Saudi today is headed towards the future with no stops. Perhaps the next few years will be a revelation for the rest of the world as Saudi doubles down on its technology investments, its focus on developing its talent pool and potentially becoming a powerhouse of different industries and a hub in the Middle East. All of the sectors that we are working at, be it health, be it energy, can be definitely affected by data and artificial intelligence, even the renewable energy. Uh, in fact, we are working now in the energy and the health sector, uh, trying to use data and AI techniques to advance those sectors. So we believe that data and AI could be key to many of our challenges. I can say openly, Saudi is serious about this. They have realized the need for economic diversification and for having the Saudi people participate both in the value creation and the value capture of technology and to improve the lives of, of you know, Saudi consumers, Saudi market participants, etc. So people will see you know, the transformation and the economic growth of Saudi as a very real thing. It will entice them to commit to the region and to commit to the country, as we have. We're actively here. Our largest asset anywhere is built here because we acknowledge the size of the market. We see the opportunity. We found like-minded partners like in Nadek, and Nadek's partly owned by the Public Investment Fund, right, all the way up to the leadership here. There, you really see an appetite for change, and I think that excites people like me and entrepreneurs who want to make an impact and want to build something exciting. The Middle East is the new Europe, particularly when looking at the demographics of this region. And there's almost 500 million young people in the Middle East, you know, people under the age of 30. The promise and potential around this region is enormous and serious amounts of investment into getting this youth into technical jobs, STEM jobs, into technology. So I think you're going to see a hub for programming, you know, a hub for cybersecurity excellence, a hub for gaming and uh, you know, software engineering. It's very exciting and it's definitely a place of growth. Saudi Arabia is creating the largest esports arena in the world right now. I see Saudi Arabia becoming the next big hub for esports. It will be the future for gaming. We're the biggest economy in the Middle East. We are the largest oil transporter in the world. So we do have a, a big responsibility. We are also the, the Islamic destination for a big Muslim nation. A lot of responsibility on Saudi Arabia and I think we are standing up to this responsibility and continue to drive this change in the region and continue to be the backbone of the Middle East. The future is ever so elusive and unpredictable, but very much available to us in plain sight if we choose to look at the right signals. The world today is at a crossroads between fighting disease that transcends nations Wars that are crippling the global economy and unpredictable financial and other events that impact not just one country but everyone across the world. Saudi Arabia is moving fast towards a new vision, Vision 2030, and has invested significantly in its infrastructure and technology. The next few years are going to be the beginning of a new era, the era of the digital kingdom. My journey as a filmmaker takes me to places where the story is not breaking, but where breakthroughs are happening. 
and where massive changes are happening in the future. The digital kingdom has been made possible by the trust and help of a lot of people, and we thank everyone who was part of this journey. A big thanks to Informa, Michael Champion, Annabelle Mander, and the team that hosted us at Leap. I'd also like to thank the leadership team at Sedaya who were extremely generous with their time with us and everyone who took the time to interview with us. And lastly, those who believe that Saudi Arabia is an incredible place to be.